Okay. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you had a good lunch. Did anyone go into town or stay here? <laughs> anyway, okay. I'm just going to give a quick um, introduction to uh, this new initiative that was launched last year. It's called Open Source Science. Uh, it lives at NumFocus, which uh, was mentioned earlier, is a nonprofit in the U.S. that is the home to many um, well-known multi Python projects, including Jupyter and Pandas and NumPy and SciPy. And uh, the goal behind this initiative is to accelerate scientific research by improving the way open source software gets done in science. There are a few um, surprising challenges that I'm going to get into. So this is me. I'm at IBM Research. I do community. And uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like. So big picture, we're facing some pretty pressing issues as a, as a planet, as a uh, society, including you know, climate and diseases and, and, and many other things. And we're going to need a lot of science over the next few years, if not decades. And without a really more robust, much more robust infrastructure and foundation of open source, it's going to be much harder to make progress. And some of the challenges that we're facing um, include um, this phenomenon that people are constantly reinventing the wheel, um, solving the same challenges over and over. Uh, another challenge is that we are seeing people build cool software that then just dies on the vine in some, you know, abandoned GitHub repo. Uh, there's uh, not just in science, but in science in particular, lots of challenges around sustainability and funding of um, open source projects. Um, we see that often people don't have a consistent way of uh, getting trained and onboarded into um, doing good open source. Um, unlike in the private sector where the people developing open source are usually software people, in science it's usually science people and uh, they can have a hard time making this a part of their career paths. Um, we see gaps between domain experts and um, uh, people with the computer science and software engineering skills and the question becomes how do you bridge those gaps? Uh, it still can be hard to pitch open source to the people that hold the purse strings. Um, overall, we see a lot of incentives misaligned. misaligned um, Vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, ideal open source um, culture and I'm sure there are many more. And so what this open source science initiative tries to do is uh, improve things by bringing together scientists and open source developers and other stakeholders to share best practices, to identify common pain points, and to explore solutions together. Um, so as I mentioned, we're a non-focused program launched last July. Um, and how we work is we've set up a number of interest groups. Uh, we have three domain specific groups, um, on chemistry, material science, on climate and sustainability, and then very soon also on life sciences and healthcare. Um, and because it sits under an unfocus, anyone can suggest additional groups that should be added to the mix. Um, we also have a couple of horizontal groups. Um, one is focused on uh, the question of reproducible science and the other is building a, a map that will let you explore the interrelations between existing tools and the published research and the people involved behind both. Uh, the map of science is a pretty cool project. We're starting to actually do some uh, prototyping and this is uh, some data we collected at a recent conference in Greece, where we just show uh, orange here are the projects that are used by these, um, the people attending this conference, and then blue are the contributors on GitHub and GitLab. Um, just starting to see some very basic non-earth shattering yet, but 
you know, interesting relations between those projects. Um, so you could imagine if you were to start a new science initiative, you could maybe we maybe want to talk to some of the people that are involved in several of these uh, open source projects. Uh, other events, other activities that we do, we do events um, in person. We are starting to do uh, virtual meetups um, probably later this year, um, as well as uh, new content that we're starting to publish focusing on learning about these various projects and how they operate. And so that is a very high level intro. And the reason we're interested to be here is because uh, AI, of course, has come up many times in these domains that we cover, um, including generative AI. And as I mentioned earlier, we're very interested in connecting uh, this emerging community with the latest um, you know, trends and skills in um, open source generative AI um, and to bridge those two worlds. Um, that was a quick intro. Any questions? If you're interested, you can follow us. We're on LinkedIn. We have a newsletter. There's a website, opensource.science. Um, and uh, expect to hear some things emerge over the next few months as people bring up these AI topics in the interest groups. I'll ask a question. Sure. Because, you know, you guys have not been there, but team was there, and I think it's, it's really interesting. Right? So I guess kind of what is the most typical friction points you see between scientists and open source people, and like how can we as developers here, I think mostly, right? Like how can we help scientists advance? So those problems like how do you see what's a good way for people here to engage right and help scientists yeah so i mean one um one point of friction is definitely the 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 the, the skill gap right so you have people developing code who are I, I call them science people versus software people but of course that's a very you know it's a, it's a simplification but um who are you know developing code for the purpose of, let's say, publishing a paper or, or getting a PhD, um, but then not having the time and resources to really make sure the code can live on in some or is you know is set up in a way that could be um, for it to be continue to add value in some community or in collaboration with others uh, beyond the publishing date of that paper. Um, and so really trying to attract not just scientists, but also people who have the, 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 the software engineering, the coding skills to um, share their best practices and help scientists, um, you know, overcome their challenges. Um, the, uh, there are, we also are looking for uh, examples of where people in the field are innovating and trying to find new ways of doing things. So. Uh, there's, with regard to managing the skill gap between, or this this gap between the domain experts and the um, the, the people who understand software, there are uh, different approaches emerging, and we're looking to, um, you know, highlight success stories and and uh, share um, insights that people gather from these experiments. Whether it's like upskilling scientists to some degrees, or um, putting people in the middle that can kind of mediate between those those two groups, right? So, uh, in some cases they're called research software engineers. Um, whether it's standing up a new unit at a university that can has software engineering jobs to help, you know, certain projects um, advance. So we're interested in bringing together those experiments, hopefully successful experiments. Thank you. I just a few feedback. I say. I think uh, scientific kind of uh, application, you need a lot of domain knowledge. For most of the software engineer, 
they probably either forgot a long time or they did not actually um, focus on that because every software engineer is very busy for their current job and then things like that. So I, I don't know, I mean, maybe school, uh, academic is probably have more people, I mean, student interest to gain to the scientific, unless uh, unless the software engineer is focused on this vertical area, certainly they will. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the, right. the challenge, right? So, so either you try to uh, get the scientist to become more of a, of someone who can do software things, or you bring in people who understand software, but then they have to first understand what the science wants to accomplish, like in the specific domain, right? So it's not an easy, uh, easy fix, but yeah. So with this initiative, we're trying to bring these two worlds together, right? So open source culture and and science, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, and we just wanted to mention here because I think we're going to see uh, more things come out specifically with regard to uh, open source AI because that's we see that kind of starting to gain more traction. Yeah, the, I think the focus of a lot of these tools is AI. So like scientists who do material science, they look how can generative AI generate new materials. People who do cancer treatment, look how can we make new drugs and understand what's going on, right? So like it's, it's a lot of it is AI. So in scientists generally across the disciplines, they want AI. It's life-hate relation, but they doubt it can help because like they have all the knowledge, right? So it's a very interesting tension. They want the AI to help them, but they're afraid it's gonna, first of all, it's gonna waste their time. Right now it's very inefficient. And second, like nobody knows what's gonna happen if they actually, AI starts to behave like a scientist, right? So I think it's everywhere across the board. So it's very, very urgent. Cool, all right. Thank you, Tim. That was it.